On February 19, 1994, 31-year-old Gloria Ramirez was rushed to Riverside General Hospital in California at 8.15 p.m. Gloria, who'd been previously diagnosed with cervical cancer, was conscious but confused and unable to answer any questions properly. Her heart was beating too fast for her body, her breathing was shallow, and her blood pressure was quickly dropping. Despite the efforts of the emergency department to save her life, Gloria was not responding to treatment, and after trying to defibrillate her heart, things began to take a turn for the truly strange and mysterious. The ER staff began to suffer from various ailments like dizziness, shallow breathing, and some even fainted without rhyme or reason. Within just 20 minutes, the entire ER was evacuated and quarantined, while doctors stayed behind and worked tirelessly in an attempt to save the young woman's life. Gloria Ramirez passed away less than an hour after her arrival, and to this day, her death, as well as the mysterious illness that affected the ER staff, remains unexplained. On today's episode of After Dark, we dive deep into the mysterious death of Gloria Ramirez and try to uncover just what really happened to the toxic lady of Riverside General Hospital. Not very much is known about Gloria Ramirez outside of the incident that made her infamous. But what we do know is that she was a 31-year-old Latino woman who resided in Riverside, California with her husband and two children. She had been diagnosed with late-stage cervical cancer prior to the incident, but according to her medical records, she had not begun chemotherapy or radiation for her condition. In the week leading up to the ER visit, she was also reported to be suffering from nausea and vomiting due to her condition, and was placed on an anti-nausea medication. This is all we know, all that I could find out about this woman while researching this case. I wish I could tell you more about how she planned to treat her condition, her psychological state, or who she even was as a person, but unfortunately the information is just not there. That being said, let's move on to the timeline of events. At 7.50 p.m., paramedics are called to the Ramirez household, where they find Gloria in acute distress with an irregular heartbeat and labored breathing. Her medical history was discussed with paramedics as they put her into the ambulance and immediately supplied her with an oxygen mask as well as a standard IV saline drip. At 8.15 p.m., Mrs. Ramirez is semi-conscious and sluggishly responsive when she arrives at the Riverside General Emergency Department. She presented with rapid breathing and a shallow heartbeat, and her condition quickly deteriorated and a full-code cardiopulmonary resuscitation was begun by the ER staff. It's at this point that things begin to take a turn for the weird. Gloria was placed on a ventilator by a Dr. Maureen Welch, and a nurse, a woman by the name of Susanna Kane, started a second IV bag and proceeded to draw a blood sample from the patient's arm. It was at this point that Nurse Kane noted the smell of ammonia coming from the patient, as well as a fruity, garlicky odor coming from her mouth. Shortly after this, Susan Kane lost consciousness. She would be the first to drop, and she was replaced by a Dr. Julie Gorchinsky, who not only confirmed the smell of ammonia coming from Gloria Ramirez, but also noted white or manila-colored particles floating in Gloria's blood sample. A Dr. Ocha, chair of the Department of Emergency Medicine, also confirmed seeing the particles in the patient's blood sample. Shortly after this, Dr. Gorchinsky lost consciousness and began suffering from intermittent respiratory distress and convulsions. At this point, Dr. Welch, the woman who had originally intubated Gloria and was monitoring the ventilator that she was placed on, also lost consciousness and several other emergency staff began to fall ill. At this point, Dr. Ocha ordered the evacuation of the ER, and he, along with a skeleton crew of doctors and nurses, remained behind to continue efforts to save Gloria's life, but ultimately she failed to respond and was pronounced dead at 8.50 p.m., just one hour after paramedics had first arrived at the Ramirez home. 
Nearly two dozen hospital workers were affected by this incident, and six of the ER staff had to be hospitalized for their symptoms. Most made a quick recovery, only suffering from temporary breathing issues, with Dr. Gorchinsky suffering the worst of the damage. She would ultimately spend two weeks in an intensive care unit with hepatitis and a vascular necrosis of her knee, which is where bone tissue doesn't get enough oxygen and begins to die. Because of this, she would ultimately end up needing crutches for months after she was released. After Gloria was pronounced dead, her body was placed in a double sealed bag in an airtight casket and sent to the county coroner. And after testing for hazardous gases was concluded with negative results, the ER was extensively sanitized and reopened by 7 a.m. the next morning. According to Cal OSHA, the Riverside Department of Public Works, the California Department of Health Services, and even an independent engineering firm, they were not able to identify any potential hazards that may have contributed to the event. After testing the hospital vents, plumbing, and drainage systems, the available medications, and even the hospital cleaning supplies. Gloria's cause of death was listed as cardiac dysrhythmia brought on by acute kidney failure, which was caused by her diagnosis of cervical cancer. Her blood work came back normal with no drugs, toxins, or poisons found in her system, and her tissues and organs were found to be clean of any toxic, volatile species, or hazardous vapors, according to the medical examiner reports. As I said, Gloria had not yet begun chemotherapy or radiation therapy for her cancer, and to this date, no reasonable chemical explanation exists for what exactly happened in the Riverside ER that night. Because of the lack of explanation and evidence, the Department of Health Services would issue a report proposing that the events were the result of mass hysteria upon the discovery of the smell of ammonia coming from the patient. But this theory was not well received, and in fact, the doctors and nurses present that night would go on record as stating that this explanation made absolutely no sense given the circumstances, but we'll talk about that more in just a moment. So what really happened? Well, we don't know for sure, and it's likely that we may never really know how one 31-year-old cancer patient and a mother of two would end up turning into a human weapon of mass destruction. But that hasn't stopped the medical community everywhere from trying to explain just what happened that night. With all that being said, and the timeline being set down, let's move on into the theories. So the most common theory presented involves the use of a chemical known as DMSO, or dimethyl sulfoxide, which was found in large quantities in Gloria's body. DSMO is a colorless, oily liquid that has a garlicky smell to it once it's been ingested meaning if someone eats it, their breath might smell a little bit like garlic. It's derived from wood pulp and is capable of dissolving many things, which makes it perfect in its main use as an industrial solvent. So why would this woman have an industrial solvent in her system? Well, I assure you it wasn't anything weird. In fact, DMSO has been used for a long time as a sort of miracle cure and home remedy. It actually does have its uses as an anti-inflammatory and a topical pain reliever. In fact, a lot of muscle creams from the 70s used to contain dimethyl sulfoxide as an ingredient. DMSO has also been used as an anti-anxiety, an antidepressant, an antipsychotic, a sedative, a tranquilizer, and it's even been used as a home remedy for cervical cancer. I would also like to state that none of these claims are approved by the FDA. It is really a home remedy. But that being said, there are a ton of reasons that Gloria may have had this chemical in her system. The folk remedy itself is huge in Mexican culture and society, so to assume that she was using it to deal with the pain of her cancer is a pretty fair assumption. The official explanation, however, goes a little bit into left field. According to the initial accident report done by OSHA, Gloria had been using the recreational drug PCP by absorbing it through her skin using DMSO as a carrier cream to apply the narcotic. So like, of all the actual legitimate reasons that Gloria Ramirez would have had to be using DMSO, OSHA chose to go with PCP. Okay, well, there must be a reason for that, right? Maybe the drug was found in her system in small amounts or something. Nope. Nothing. Nada. No drugs. Didn't even find paraphernalia or drugs in her home. Also, that's not exactly how PCP works. In order for the drug to be in a liquid state, it usually needs to be cut with something highly flammable, generally ether, and then it is sprayed onto a smokable material or injected. Which, let me add this as a side note, do not drink or smoke anything that you did not prepare yourselves. Pro tip. The fumes from the ether alone would have made this method of application entirely too complicated, with more of a chance that you would pass out from chemical inhalation before the effects of the drug even take place. 
Interestingly, however, the report was later changed to state the analysis did not support the use of PCP and that there were no traces of any illicit substances in her system. So why am I talking about this drug and how does it fit into her death? A report was issued by Forensic Science International in 1997 that claimed it was entirely possible for a buildup of DMSO in her system to be then converted into a chemical known as DMSO2 in her body, which upon receiving oxygen and then electric shocks from the medical team, converted the DMSO2 into a deadly compound, DMSO4, which is what caused her death as well as the sickness seen in the staff. So sit down and get comfortable because I'm about to break this nonsense down for y'all. It's science time. Okay. So DMSO is known as dimethyl sulfoxide, and it's used as a topical pain reliever, as I said. It is also important to note that DMSO is excreted through the kidneys and flushed in the urine, except for a very small amount that is excreted through the lungs, which can cause a fruity or garlicky smell on the breath. The idea here is that Gloria began taking or using DMSO as an at-home remedy for her cancer pain. On the coroner's report, it stated that Gloria was suffering from a condition called obstructive uropathy, and we know that she had a recent history of nausea and vomiting from the paramedic's account. So basically she couldn't pee and she was vomiting, which would have made her likely dehydrated. And since DMSO needs to be excreted through urine, if she wasn't producing any or much at all, then the drug would have instead built up in her system over time. But regardless of why it was in her system, we know for sure that it was, and it was present in high levels. So the official theory goes like this. Step one. Gloria began taking DMSO, and over time it built up in her system, causing a large amount of the chemical to be present. Step two, the paramedics administer oxygen, causing a chemical reaction with the DMSO, turning it into DMSO2 or dimethylene sulfone, which is why the ER staff reported the smell of fruity garlic on Gloria's breath. Dimethyl sulfone can also crystallize under certain conditions, which may explain the manila particles in Gloria's blood sample. Step three, the DMSO2 converted into a lethal gas known as DMSO4, which is known as dimethyl sulfate, a chemical that has been considered useful in war and is an extremely potent, very effective, and extremely fatal. So that's it. Case closed, am I right? She was taking a drug for pain, and in a freak set of circumstances, her body converted that chemical into another more dangerous chemical that essentially turned her into a human A-bomb. Except it's not, because according to the same report that proposed this theory, the direct conversion of DMSO2 into DMSO4 has never been observed before. Because DMSO4 is produced synthetically by a reaction of two different chemicals that I will not name because I will not be teaching y'all how to make a nerve gas today. But it is technically possible, right? Because we can't prove or disprove what may or may not have taken place in Gloria's body on a biochemical level as she was dying, so in that context, even though we've never seen it happen and all the evidence points towards the conversion of these chemicals not being possible, it's still technically possible. It would have taken so many chemical processes that are hard to reproduce in a lab, let alone a single body of a dying woman. And seeing as how this event is considered a medical mystery and to my knowledge has not been repeated itself, I can't get behind the idea that this one woman by absolute chance became a human weapon of mass destruction. But the Riverside Coroner's Office quickly, and despite many arguments against it, released this theory as an absolute fact without any further follow-up or testing. They just got the paperwork and said, yep, that works, let's go with it. Close case, I'm done. Despite argument of the healthcare professionals present that it didn't explain everything and it was too much of a reach to be considered plausible. Theory number two, poor hospital conditions. Several weeks before the Ramirez incident, a 52-year-old cancer patient by the name of Dennis Weiss and his wife were overcome by noxious fumes while staying at the same hospital. According to Weiss, the smell was so strong that it made him vomit before his wife eventually went for help. The staff of the Riverside General claimed that the smell was due to nurses on the above floors dumping cleaners into the hospital plumbing system. Two days later, the fumes filled his room again, this time forcing his visiting wife and daughter to leave. A spokesperson for California's Division of Occupational Safety and Health went on record as stating that the hospital had previously been cited in 1990 and 1991 for violating exposure standards relating to the use of ethylene oxide, an extremely toxic gas usually used for sterilizing instruments. It was also cited in both years for failing to maintain annual inspection records of the hospital ventilation systems, and in 1993, sewer gas was detected in the hospital's ER, making it fairly easy to assume the health and safety standards aren't exactly a top priority for this facility. What's more than that, Gloria's family had also filed a medical malpractice suit, as according to the family, the coroner had originally stated that Gloria did not die from natural causes, but later changed his opinion, 
and the syringe containing Gloria's blood, along with the mysterious particles, was accidentally thrown away. The family believed that the hospital was covering up what really happened to her that day, but any records of how that lawsuit turned out are unfortunately not available. Theory number three, and probably the most outlandish out of all of them, to be honest, drug trafficking. In 1997, the New Times LA published a theory in which they claimed that Gloria's death and the illness of the 23 staff members was caused by methylamine, a drug used in the production of methamphetamine. And interestingly, methylamine is reported to have an ammonia-like smell. According to this theory, members of the hospital staff were involved in drug making and smuggling. It is thought that they could have been using IV bags to smuggle the methylamine and an infected bag was accidentally given to Gloria, killing her and infecting the rest of the staff. Methylamine, when it comes in contact with the skin, causes a burning a lot like frostbite in the affected area. And the symptoms of methylamine poisoning are not so severe as to cause the symptoms that Dr. Gorchinsky suffered months after her exposure to this toxic woman. Also, this chemical is extremely flammable, like violently flammable when exposed to certain chemicals. So keeping it stored in an IV bag where it can be exposed to light, temperature fluctuations, and evil possibly leaking chemicals from other bags, and even in the air, could potentially cause it to explode. So to recap, there were no burns on Gloria that would suggest that her IV was filled with a potentially corrosive chemical. There was no burning inside of her body that would suggest that it had been flowing through her veins either. And honestly, if traffickers were going to spend the time, money, and effort to smuggle this chemical, which they do, I mean, we've all seen Breaking Bad, but it would cost someone a lot of money if the product they were smuggling just, I don't know, exploded because it was kept in unpredictable conditions and exposed to multiple drugs and chemicals. And also to suggest that Gloria was accidentally given a dosed bag is equally far-fetched as I'm no expert, but I'm pretty certain that whoever would be tracking this chemical would have kept better track of their supply and it doesn't seem safe to let it sit in a hospital where potentially hundreds of people could find it, contaminate it, or blow it up. I mean, if you think about it, that's just bad business, really. This case has been passed around in various sleuthing communities online and there have been a lot of theories proposed. But the bottom line is that as much as we would want to put an end to this case, we really don't know what happened that day in the Riverside General Emergency Room. From samples being lost to tests just flat out not being done, a lot of people dropped the ball in this case, and unfortunately that means that despite all of our best efforts, we may never know what actually happened to Gloria Ramirez. But I'm curious, after hearing all of this, what do you think happened to her? Was it a freak accident? A chemical reaction that has never been seen before or since that took place in the body of a dying woman? Or was it simply a case of mass hysteria? Let me know your thoughts down below, 